Hello and welcome to Build Back Better and hopefully another informative and inspiring conversation with a regional change maker. Today I am talking to Jeremy Miles, Minister with the Welsh Government. He's a member of the Senate for Neath and Jeremy is Council General for Wales in the Welsh Government and he's also Wales's Brexit Minister. But more recently, Jeremy Miles was appointed to take charge of Wales's recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. I've met Jeremy a few times, partly because he's organised a number of business forums in the Neath area, which have proved just a really great way to talk to local businesses and crowdsource priorities and ideas around economic development in the area. And I really appreciate it when decision makers make that effort to go out there and engage with people and businesses. And I think Jeremy is great at that. So it's my pleasure to welcome you, Jeremy. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me, Dawn. It's a pleasure to be with you. I'm sure you've been hugely busy. I know everybody has in Welsh Government. It's been an incredibly busy time. As the Welsh Minister in charge of Wales's recovery from COVID-19, I mean, no pressure there. What's been the focus of your work over the last few months? And I know there's been a new advisory panel has been formed. I wonder what are some of the key themes emerging around Wales's COVID-19 recovery? Well, well, firstly, thank you for the opportunity to talk about this. If I describe how my involvement has started, and then I can talk a little bit about what we've been doing as a government. Clearly, as soon as the effects of coronavirus became apparent, the government in Wales acted immediately in relation to that. There was a, a lockdown which happened at the same time across the UK. And there was a period, and you know that, that continues really, when very big decisions were being made around very serious limitations on people's freedom. The government had never had to do that before in Wales, and we hope never to have to do it again. The original focus was on making sure that people were safe and the public health priority was dominant, obviously, in all our considerations. And that touched all aspects of government in all truth. It's, you know, the health department, obviously, social care, the economy, schools you know, all aspects of government really have been devoted principally to tackling COVID. And that is still the case. And I just thought I should say at this point, I think that the response of people in Wales has been quite remarkable, generally speaking. And I think it's there's a sense of personal responsibility, which has come along with that. Part of that process, it became quickly apparent that the scale of the impact of COVID on many aspects of life in Wales was going to be very dramatic. And also became obvious that the longer the period of lockdown was likely to continue, then probably the impact was going to be greater as well in different aspects. So children's education, trading conditions for businesses, those things which are obvious to us now, weren't quite so obvious at the time. What the First Minister asked me to do was to lead a piece of work which had and has a slightly longer time horizon than the day-by-day -day decisions the government was taking to to intervene in a whole range of ways and to, as it were, kind of lift our sights and look at what the long-term impacts of COVID would be in Wales and what we as the government should do to prepare for that. Now, the government has a range of levers. Obviously, I've got a colleague in cabinet whose job is to look after economic development. I've got a colleague in cabinet whose job is to look after the school system and so on. And the work I'm doing, obviously, isn't du doesn't duplicate that, doesn't cut across that. But the objective that I've been set really is to help the government overall have a common understanding of what lies ahead and that will enable us to have a common set of priority across the government. So what that has meant in practical terms is a few things. Firstly, I've set up a, an email address, ourfuturewales at gov.wales, which is our invitation to people right across Wales to send in their thoughts about what they think should be our priorities in handling the response to COVID as in you know the reconstruction um, and we've had a, about 1500 submissions in the course of what can only be 12 or 13 weeks which you know for anybody who knows anything about a Welsh government consultation is is uh, very significant numbers and alongside that I've been keen to make sure that you know, we have a civil service that is very expert at devising policy, implementing policy, coming up with ideas for ministers to test and for us to measure these ideas against our values. So we have a very well established system and organisation which does that. In the context of COVID, everybody's working in a very new context, firstly, certainly in terms of the scale of it, 
and the unprecedented nature of things coming together as they have the various impacts striking at the same time. And the second point is this, we have things to learn from other parts of the world who have been doing things before us because they suffered the consequences before us. So one of the things I was tasked by the First Minister to do was to try and get some external challenge into our thinking as a government about how we respond. I suppose you might say, if we were being critical, you might say the easy thing for any government to do is to say, you must do more of what we were doing before. But we quickly realised that wouldn't be the right lens to apply, given the scale of the change. So by getting some external voices in, we felt there would be you know, a sense of creative challenge, if you like. And... Some of the things we've heard in that process have been to confirm that we were on the right track. We just needed to do more of it or do it faster, for example. Some of it just said, yes, basically all what you're doing is fine. But there's another group of sort of ideas that say, well, you know, in these new conditions, you need to do X, Y and Z differently. So in order to capture that information and capture that thinking, I've chaired a range of roundtables. First set of them were from people from outside Wales and outside the UK, actually, to get a different context for some of our thinking. And the second round have been people who are experts in their fields and live in Wales and work in Wales. Both those sets of discussions have been organised along the lines of three pillars. We've been testing questions which relate to economic justice and what that means for both the economy generally, but the impact on vulnerable people in particular. A second strand of work has been around the impact on public services. Clearly, we've seen significant change in a number of public services, not least the health service social care service which you know we will all recognize the impact on those important parts of our public services but local authorities have been delivering advice services and other services virtually and there's many examples of that happening in different parts of our public service so public transport is a particular challenge so a range of issues in that space and then the third big set of issues is around environmental justice because as a government we are committed to a resilient sustainable economy and we are very clear that we do not want the response to COVID to be at the cost of those commitments because we think ultimately those commitments are in the right you know in the interest of Wales and the right commitments in the longer term and of course they also we can come on to talk maybe a little bit later if you like about how they sit with some of the obligations we have on ourselves as a government under the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act because that question of sustainability is obviously at the heart of that. So we've run three sets of discussions with sets of different experts. And we've now created after that a small standing group of four experts who we test our ideas against. And again, they give us a sense of challenge or you know, fresh ideas about some of the solutions to this. So that's, that's been the process. Just to say, before I talk a little bit about the emerging themes that you asked me about, Dawn, just one of the things which is, I think, hopefully obvious to people, scale of the response, both in Wales and across the UK to COVID, in terms of the resources required by health and care sector, the resources required by the economy de departments, if you like to support businesses, has been literally unprecedented in the size, in, in the time scale that we are looking at. And, you know, whether it's to do with business support, where well, we've put our own business support schemes in place in Wales, which, if you like, plug the gaps in some of the UK government's support schemes, that isn't you know, it's not really a criticism that UK government looks at the UK wide picture. We've got a different profile of business and sectors in Wales. So, you know, our task has been not to, just to duplicate what the UK government has done, but to try and look through the lens of Welsh businesses, organisations and so on to see what else needs to happen in Wales. So the consequence of that is that businesses in Wales have had the most generous support package of any part of the UK, in effect. Has, has it met the needs of every single business? Obviously not. Uh, it could no, none, none of the interventions could do that, but we feel pretty strongly that it's done a pretty good job of meeting at least the urgent needs of a very significant number of businesses in Wales. And the task, obviously, is to try and help businesses either to hibernate, if you like, for the short term so they can emerge when the pressures of COVID start to lift, or to enable businesses to transform to do different things. And there have been examples of that in Wales as well, which we can talk a little bit about further in terms of, you know, some of the manufacturing opportunities that have been created, really, and have been exploited by really innovative businesses in our part of the world, many in my own constituency, but others in the region and across Wales. So that's been the scale of the resource challenge. And what that means in practical terms for us as a government is that if you were to put a list of things that we need to do to respond to COVID, let alone the list of things we needed to do anyway. And then other side of the ledger, the resources available to us. The resources aren't sufficient to do everything that we need to do. 
So we are not in a position where we are dropping things off the list of things which are not, you know, things which are just unimportant. There are big decisions which lie ahead around how we prioritise the resources that we have and so on. So this piece of work is intended to inform that as well. What are the key themes that you asked me about? So I'll take each of those three blocks in turn, because I think that's probably quite a good way of looking at it. So there's one common theme which has emerged in all those areas, be it about the economy and vulnerable people, be it about public services, be it about the environment, is that the burden of responding to COVID has been disproportionately distributed. So there are certain groups of people in society who are feeling the pain particularly hard. Now, in a health context, we know what those are. We know that older people have been particularly at risk of some aspects of coronavirus. We know that BME communities have been particularly at risk as well for reasons which we're starting to understand better than we did. So from a health perspective, there are very obvious groups of people who are at particular risk. The economic response as well has been borne disproportionately by different people. So women are overrepresented in sectors that have been uh, gone into lockdown. Young people have been hugely overrepresented in, in sectors that have gone into lockdown. Almost all the people who are in furlough in the youth category are in that because they work in a sector which has gone into lockdown. So it's really very, very marked. Our task as a government really is to try and make up that injustice in our response. Another theme which has emerged across the board is the intergenerational challenge that we face. So from an economic point of view, there are young people entering the job market this summer who ordinarily would be hoping to get work, whose job prospects now are very small in comparison with what they would normally be. If we don't do something to support those people, they will carry that disadvantage, if you like, through their entire working career. So there's a, a generation of people who we need to respond to in order to be able to make sure they don't carry that burden with them through life. You've got to look at the combined effect of Brexit and COVID in this space, really, because although we've got two huge transformational influences in our economy in this context, we have one future, don't we? So those things play out together. If you look at sectors and how they're impacted in Wales, there are some sectors like automotive, aerospace, they are adversely affected both by COVID and by Brexit. And then in the rest of the economy, there's a sort of a grim complementarity, really. You've got the domestic sectors like um, tourism, leisure, hospitality, cultural sector that have been very, very badly hit by COVID, as we know. And then you've got other sectors which export, uh, which will be possibly, probably badly hit by the kind of deal that the UK government may be heading towards. So, I mean, I don't want to make a party political point. I'm just giving a context to that set of challenges, really. The truth of the matter is we don't know yet what the outcome is going to be in terms of the kind of recovery but we do have a pretty clear idea that the level of job losses is likely to be pro proportionately higher than the last recession because companies going into this period were you know less productive and carrying more debt than they were going into the last recession so you know their prospects of coming out of it are more challenging a very large number of otherwise well-run companies if you like are going to be coming out of this period carrying a lot of debt on their balance sheet even if they've been run brilliantly if you like that's going to be a factor and so one of the challenges for us as governments both in Wales and across the UK is how do you persuade those employers to invest in the workforce into the future it's always been a challenge quite honestly you know not all employers are interested in doing it some for better reasons than others I suppose but in this climate it's going to be even more challenging and so the skills response of the government and the governments everywhere is going to be essential the role of FE in that is going to be essential to keep people on in education but one thing we keep being told consistently is because the job market is so likely to be flat is I suppose a neutral word for using it for, for, for it but you know there aren't going to be jobs being created in some sectors certainly. One of the tasks of government is to keep people in edu education as long as possible really so they can benefit from additional qualifications and not be in the job market at a time when jobs or decent jobs are hard to get. I think it's important not to paint a picture which is universal across the economy. Obviously this will be felt in different ways in different sectors and we shouldn't simply assume that no part of the economy is going to recover. Obviously that isn't the case. Different parts of the economy will recover in different ways at different speeds. And so the task is to make sure that the employment opportunities, we take advantage of the opportunities in the parts of the economy that are coming back to life. So that's the kind of economic picture. 
at least some of the things we are being told. I wouldn't claim that's a comprehensive picture. On public services, there's obviously some sectors that are, that are in need of particular reform as a consequence of COVID. Some of the things that we've learned on the positive side of the ledger is the capacity of the health service in particular to respond in an incredibly nimble way to the challenges that have lay ahead. Now, that's partly because we've rescheduled people's care. And so there are lots of people who will have been on a waiting list going into COVID who, whose waiting list now is longer as a result. And again, we thank them for their contribution to the effort for tackling COVID. I visited the Swansea Bay Field Hospital in the Bay Studios recently with Councillor Rob Stewart and officials from the Health Board. And it's quite remarkable, really, that there is a thousand, I think, I think 1,100 bed hospital there built to clinical conditions with you know with with healthcare to, to healthcare standards really and, and, and safety standards which was built in i think about eight weeks and you know the challenge for us is or the opportunity for us really if you're looking at it positively is not to unlearn the way of working that has enabled that to happen you know now it's obviously easier in a crisis environment isn't it because i shouldn't say it's easier but the dynamics around it are different i think people's tolerance of risk is higher because because it's a crisis and so some of the things which ordinarily we would want to take longer over isn't an option in that scenario so you know there are systemic reasons about wh why systems are easy to join up during a crisis context we shouldn't lose sight of that however the cultural things that we've learned about how to minimize barriers for working together how to make processes shorter how to work collaboratively and procure in a way which you know may go beyond the sort of contract value and to look at how relationships and networks can be built all of that is good learning and we must not unlearn it in a time which is more hopefully more benign and i think if you want an example of how commissioners governments contractors have been able to work together i would say very smoothly you can go and see any of the field hospitals really i think swansea bay is a good example because it's you know it's not it's not very temporary the way that some of the others are really it doesn't need to be very temporary and i also spoke to some of the contractors you know because obviously as you know talking to politicians and commissioners you know you would expect the message to be we've been able to get this done in a way which is joined up and smooth and it's true by the way but you know you'd possibly expect that message i would give that message myself but to talk to the contractors who are saying to me you know this has been very smooth you know we've all worked very well we've been able to reprioritize we've been collaborating and being sharing information you know that is stuff which we mustn't lose but on the downside if you like it is evident coming out of at least this part of the COVID experience, that the social care sector is facing challenges of resilience. Public transport has a new set of challenges which it needs to tackle. The task for us in those spaces is to try and find out how we can learn lessons of COVID. The truth of the matter is, though, that some of those challenges, many of them, in fact, are not new. They're pre-existing challenges that we have known that we have, and actually, to be fair, that we have been trying to tackle but the, the need to do that has become more urgent finally on this i think there's an interesting possibility for us in terms of how to deliver services digitally more extensively if you like in the future so we're extending that already in the healthcare sector there's been a pilot to launch digital consultations in this in dentistry and other fields so i think that's positive but there's a flip side to that which is managing people's digital exclusion and so the responsibility on us to make sure that is tackled. Finally, in terms of key themes, the green economy and recovery. Firstly, there's a temptation to think, well, look, we, you know, people are using their car less, people are flying less, some people are buying food more locally from high street shops, not from, you know, from supermarkets that have longer supply chains, longer geographic distribution patterns. All of that's good stuff. We think that's positive, obviously, and if we want to maintain some of that you'll have seen some of the money we've been spending on active travel but i think it's it would be complacent of us to assume that people want to continue necessarily with those behaviors i think you know there's likely to be for every person who wants to continue doing that there'll be somebody else who wants things to just return to normal so i think we've got to actually capture that and i think the other challenge is there would be a temptation to say look at this point the key is to stimulate the economy it's not about sustainability it's not about all the nice to have stuff you know this is how the argument would run We've got to make sure that we stimulate the economy really at any cost and we don't want to do that we want to make sure that we are fostering you know in the longer term sustainable employment in wales sustainable in all senses now there's an important note here you know we can't go to a situation where overnight we say this is the kind of you know these are the kind of priorities and nothing else you know nothing else can be on the list because we have the economy that we have and we need to make sure that people remain 
in employment and we can support their jobs because at the end of the day that's the thing that makes the biggest difference to most people's well-being and welfare so we've decided there's a sort of stabilization period which is what we are in now and then there's a sort of reconstruction period after that and you will see i think in the coming weeks so the economic resilience fund will in its next iteration have more of a bias towards uh, low carbon decarbonization sustainable sectors i mean that's one of the ideas at the moment these things haven't yet been decided and i think you can also see in this space for example around the bus services agenda we've put money on the table for bus operators to compensate them essentially for loss of fares that's a sort of emergency sustainability intervention if you like to keep the show on the road but then the next stage for that is developing a different model for the funding of bus services in wales which bluntly fixes a broken market at the moment it's the market and government has little control over the destinations the routes and all those things unless it can subsidize them and there's precious little funding available for that but actually quite a lot well huge amounts of money of public money goes into the bus sector and very little control is exercised on how it's spent so one of the opportunities for us as a government is to say well if we're going to fund you in a different way to the future then we have different expectations and those expectations need to align better with the needs of passengers in Wales, for example. Yeah, really interesting, isn't it? I mean, I think we saw in the recovery from the 2008 downturn exactly what you were just describing there, the, the pressure to just recover the economy at any cost, as you've said, and the danger of deprioritizing some of those environmental considerations. And you've talked a lot about the sort of economic justice question, which I'm really grateful to hear you talk about that pressure to recover can sometimes mean that those really important values are deprioritized and de-emphasized but I've heard you speak about the fact that we just cannot go back to business as normal and I wonder what, what you mean when you say that and, and what, what you think are the opportunities to really change the way the economy or society works so that it's not business as usual and so that we capitalize on this massive disruption. Well, I think that's a very good question. We have said that as a government, we, we certainly take it to, to heart. I mean, that is our objective in this. Partly it's linked to the point I was making earlier, which is about understanding some of these challenges have been long-standing challenges, which have been made more urgent, if you like, by the scale of the impact of COVID and the intensity on the, on the people who were already in some sense it's vulnerable or if organisations or businesses were lacking resilience. So I think the task here is twofold really. There's a, there's a sort of short-term set of lessons to learn, some of which we've learned are learning already and are doing things about it. So, you know, as I, as I mentioned earlier, the money for active travel is identifying an opportunity which has arisen as a consequence of people's changed behaviours. We put some money this week, in fact, or last week, um, into town centre transformation, which is about helping businesses become COVID compliant because, you know, we could be in this situation for some time until the vaccine is found and businesses need support to become COVID compliant. As I say, some of the things we've done around digital, extending the digital appointment stuff, and you'll have seen some money, extra money this week for social housing, for example. People's experience of their housing has been the most intimate thing, hasn't it, over the last few weeks and months. If you live in a comfortable home with, with enough space to do your to work from home, for example, then you're lucky or you know you're at one end of the spectrum but there are lots of people who live in overcrowded accommodation or inappropriate accommodation you know for whom that experience has been pretty grim quite honestly so people's housing experience is central to it and by the way on that i think one of the things which goes to the heart of you know reconstructing which is the term that i'm using really which is to reconstruct following this is is the experience of homelessness another example of kind of rapid joined up working between different levels of government and housing associations has been the ability to get you know the overwhelming majority of homeless people off the streets in Wales in the course of three weeks I think it was and a budget of about 10 million pounds so there's a, there's a real testament to all the hard work of people right across Wales to make that happen but obviously what can't be the situation where we reverse that we are working hard to find a model which enables us not to have to turn that around I mean we want to continue supporting people in that situation that's a really key issue for us so that'd be a good example I think of the sorts of things where we don't want to turn the clock back the bus investment I think is another example of how we don't want to turn the clock back there's a lot of issues a lot of areas really where we understand that people going in you know were in particular needs of of support and uh, different policy from government and that's the sort of thing that we want to 
tackle coming out of it. Further education is a good example of this. The reasons that we will all understand that our further education budgets haven't been what they should be, perhaps uh, in any part of the UK, frankly, for, for some time. But you know how we skill young people to respond to this challenge is going to be fundamental. And there's a role there for FE, for employers, for looking afresh at how we deliver apprenticeships to make them more flexible, to respond to some of these challenges. Those are all things that are on the table. How do we procure differently so that we can make sure that local supply chains develop and are nurtured? We've been making progress in that direction, but what more can we do as a government to support that? There are any number of areas really across the government where we can do things better. Where I would say we were on track, you know, we were heading in that direction. You know, these are not, as I say, many many of them are not new ideas, but I think there's more than we can do. We will want to do more in, that, in those spaces. Yeah, there's a new urgency, isn't there, around all of those things. And I know the Regional Learning and Skills Partnership have done really extensive surveys and you've talked to us as well about needing businesses and industry to really invest in skills. That's yeah. just such a key thing and keeping young people in education if the jobs yeah. aren't there for yeah. them to go into. Well, one of the one of the opportunities here, I think, and it's important, I think, to see it in that way, is that there are some things that we are learning from a range of different directions. If you're looking at an intervention or a response, which helps with your skills base, which helps with decarbonizing your economy, which helps with developing your local supply chain, which helps with your health and housing needs, for example, sort of a very obvious intervention which deals with all of those challenges is to expand green housing construction, isn't it? Especially housing, uh, social and affordable housing. So there are some solutions and interventions which meet a number of these challenges and I think one of the tasks for us for governments everywhere I think is to try and find those policies which don't as it were only meet one need but meet a range of needs if possible. Yeah multi-solving so many different problems and I mean that brings us on to talking about the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, yeah. doesn't it? Because in those seven wellbeing goals, we in Wales are lucky to have such a clear articulation of what's important to us and what we want. So we've got that as a key starting point. And, and the goal really is to develop policies and activities that address all of the seven wellbeing goals in an integrated way. So that yeah. sort of joined up multi-solving yeah priority. I think it's interesting to look at the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act and appreciate how core that is in terms of the way that the Welsh Government thinks about new policies and the policy direction. You know, is it the case that the, the seven wellbeing goals are changing the way that Wales responds as opposed to, for example, the rest of the UK that doesn't have the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act in place? Is it informing your decisions in a way where you think, oh, you see, if we didn't have the Act, we would have made a different decision there. And as a result of the Act, we're able to make a much better decision. Are there any examples? Yes. I mean, I would say so. So in terms of the mechanics of this, if you like, just to give you some insight into that, in terms of the internal government response to this, we have established a recovery directorate within the Welsh Government, uh, which supports the work that the First Minister has asked me to do. And the team, the Futures team within the Welsh Government, now sits as part of that because we see that the part of the organisation which deals with our organisational obligations under the legislation, if you like, and the part of the organisation which is planning for what we do in response to COVID, you know, obviously needs to be part of the same team, doesn't it? That's kind of weaving that idea of future generations into the work of all our responses. And I would also say that the very fact that I've been asked to do this role is about finding a kind of common vision across the government of what lies ahead and then trying, you know, trying to find a common way forward across different departments and so on. There are conversations which flow from that so you know you've got a conversation happening over here around well as we were talking about now housing for example one of the things we're looking at and we have been for some time as you know is how we expand the modular housing part of the economy so houses that are built in fact you know in parts in factories then erected on the site my own constituency there's a company doing exactly that and it's a growing company that's good i want to see more of that across across Wales. So that's happening in this space over here and in this space over here there are a set of decisions going on around the use of Welsh government land to grow timber for example. You know, so what you want to do is make sure these two things are aligned so that you've got 
a set of decisions about growing timber as a crop of you, which sustains in the medium term and longer term, a kind of modular housing or how timber constructed housing sector developing here. So bringing the environmental and economic together in that particular example. So it's that sort of thing that has a need for us to identify skills, that has a need for a set of conversations with further education providers, a set of conversations with procurement you know, experts. So it's to make sure all of that is joined up. Now I would say, actually, my own view at least, is that the consequence of the work that we've done in government in preparing for European Union exit um, over the last two years and more, I think has laid the groundwork within the Welsh government. I'm talking internally at this point. I'll say a little bit more about the external face in a second. Um, but I think it's laid the groundwork internally for much better joined up working actually than perhaps as, as needed to be the case, or certainly has been the case in the past, just because of pressure resources, time pressure, and the sense of the interconnectedness of all these challenges. So I think the challenges of addressing COVID have come to us, you know, when we have had that platform of joint working anyway, if you like. So I think that has been, in a sense, helpful if you're looking for some silver lining as a leaving the European Union, that, you know, there's some, there's some aspect of it which has changed working behaviours in that way. But in terms of what this has meant for the public or what this means for the public, I suppose it's a few things really. So it requires us to think in the following terms, for example, in terms of the economy. The challenge isn't to make sure that people have jobs which work for the next six months. You know, if you're leaving school now, what we want to be able to say to people, at least that's the objective, is we'll try and do all we can to make sure that you are getting work experience and skills in jobs which give you a fair chance of a sustainable kind of career. Now, if you're thinking of a green economy, you can set different tests, can't you? You can say, well, what I want to do is fund green jobs, but that's slightly different from sustainable jobs. Because if you're talking about tree planting, for example, people are saying to me, well, why doesn't the government set people to work on planting the national forest? And actually there's a sort of role there for helping our biodiversity goals, which is, which is clear. But actually what you're thinking at the same time is really what you want to do is make sure that you're employing people in work which ha has the prospect of progression to start with and continuity and so there's slightly different lenses through which to apply you know the, the future generations thinking really one is about a set of biodiverse challenges today and one is about a set of economic challenges in the long term and obviously there's a place for both of those but that's the sort of question that you start to ask yourself by applying that sort of lens the other kind of question that you ask yourself is it really brings into very sharp focus that question of intergenerational justice. If the economy is going to be as damaged as it looks like it's going to be, then all governments everywhere have an obligation, don't they, to be maximising the support that we give to people. And probably in the early years, you know, we all, everything we know about government intervention has always told us that the earlier that you do it in someone's life course, the more beneficial effect it has. That's the background to Flying Start, to Show a Start and all those other interventions which we know do great things in the lives of people who benefit from the service. So there's a task, isn't there, in terms of how we respond as governments everywhere to that. And our education system clearly has undergone a lot of change, at least on a temporary basis. But, you know, we're learning more about digital tuition. Some of that's good, some of it's bad. Our task as a government is to make sure the good practice is universal and we drive out the less good stuff. What does that mean for the, the schools of the future? in terms of layout and digital tuition and so on. So there are a number of long-term challenges, I think, which probably get to the top of the list only if you're applying that kind of sense of sustainable economic development and sustainable public service provision. Yeah, I think that's the key. You've, you've raised some good uh, distinctions there between what sounds like a great project, but is it sustainable and, and how you can plan for the long term. And it plays into all those themes that we were already talking about before COVID, about automation yes. and what are we going to do with a society where jobs are harder to get and there are fewer jobs and are there yes. ways, other ways that we can look at building resilience in communities yeah. in the face of all of that. So it's just another challenge, isn't it? And of course, climate emergency is looming large and that is an emergency in the same way, but it's less immediate and so the response is more difficult to generate. You talked about the urgency of the COVID crisis brings people together and that's that's the sort of work we need to be 
pulling together for the climate emergency, isn't it? But it's a, a different challenge. So I think that's a very important insight, actually. One of the things I've been most struck by in terms of people's behaviour and public sentiment, if you like, in the last few months, that's what is probably the case, is that there is a heightened understanding of, on the one hand, what a genuinely transformative crisis situation looks like, you know, a sense of immediacy of the challenge and the scale of the challenge. And then on the other hand, a sense of what the role of science is, what the role of governments can be in terms of being interventionist, and also importantly, what the role of individual human agency is in this. You know, we have all played our part, haven't we, in keeping everyone safe by abiding by the rules and by, and by exhibiting responsible behaviour to each other. That is all very positive things to have learnt about ourselves and our society. And I think it is possible to explain the climate emergency to people in the same way. You know, we have an emergency. The things that you're seeing happening around you are real. They will be transformative. They'll be transformative over a longer time horizon. And your behaviour change probably needs to be longer even than the period we spent in lockdown. But there's a narrative in there that I think you can, governments can use to explain to people what it would be like to respond at scale everywhere to the level of challenge that climate emergency brings. I've personally felt really heartened to see, amidst all the real anxiety and, and fear around the COVID-19 crisis, that my faith in the fabric of society was restored. I thought, yeah, you know, people really do care about each other. They care about their local communities. All of that pent up concern for each other that perhaps hasn't had a, an outlet for a number of years, it's all still there and we have that massive strength. And if we can motivate that to continue and, and address itself towards these other longer term challenges, then that would be a real win, wouldn't it? Yeah, absolutely right. So your constituency is Neath, and yep. I know you're a massive advocate for Neath and for our region. Yep. And like me, really passionate about Absolutely. trying to rebuild our economy and society in new ways. Where's your greatest sense of optimism or hope for our region? Where do you see the greatest opportunities? What do you think our region has that we can capitalise on to come out of this crisis stronger and more optimistic? Firstly, we've got some good employers and good organisations doing fantastic and innovative things in our part of the world. So we should definitely be celebrating that. On a kind of modest scale in Neath, my constituency, I hosted a Zoom call for about 40 businesses locally probably two or three weeks ago, hearing from some local businesses about how they would responded to the COVID challenge. So Rod Lloyd from Low Cost Fund and Alison Orrells from the Letterbox Company in Paul Morrissey from Russies, all in different ways, were telling us about the innovative things that they had been doing to respond to new challenges, you know, in terms of business lines, ways of working, workplace issues, staffing relations, distribution. So a range of areas where, you know, no one, obviously everyone was saying there have been immense challenges lately, and obviously nobody wants to have to deal with the situation that they have found themselves in, clearly. But I was very, very heartened by the focus on well let's learn what we can from this what can we do differently what can we do better some aspects of it people are saying well we don't want to go back to doing everything like we were doing it before so i think that sense of you know innovation and optimism there's much more of that in our various businesses and employers and organizations than we probably recognize and i think that's a very heartening thing and i think that's really well represented in our part of the world i think there are institutions like the university in swansea bay we need to work collaboratively to identify what local opportunities can come out of some of the work that they will be doing there in terms of research and innovation it's supposed to be forward looking as a region and I you know obviously I know that you and all the region are very focused on that work and you know that the work I've been doing in Neath of the Neath Area Economic Forum is very much about trying to spot some of those opportunities I think there's some great things that we've seen local businesses and I speak for my own constituency I don't know that other MSs and MPs in the region i'm sure we'll say the same for their constituencies as well but i can list them any number of businesses in neat constituency who have really you know ad adapted their so engineering companies or manufacturing companies in particular who spotted a firstly an opportunity but also in a sense of responsibility if you like to try and develop new product lines and so on so i think that's really optimistic i was really inspired by entrepreneurs i thought yes. you know we just need entrepreneurs 
in all areas of life yeah. because they, they don't sit there feeling sorry for themselves. Exactly. They think, how can we pivot? How can we make the best exactly. of this situation? Where are the new opportunities? Exactly. And um, I think Wales is a nation of entrepreneurs and we need to celebrate those entrepreneurs and change makers who are yes. doing just, uh, yeah. just that. So, you know, innovation, decarbonisation in businesses, I think that, you know, finding ways of really driving that through our businesses and organisations is essential. But there'll be sectors that come to the fore in a way that perhaps we might not have thought before. So I think the care sector will be will come to the fore in a range of different ways. There'll be that kind of modular housing sector. I think we'll get a boost coming from, from the COVID crisis and other sectors. And the key for us, Dawn, is to make sure that we are talking to each other across the region about the skills that we need and that we make sure that that level of skills provision is available in our region so that young people or people of any age are able to pick up the skills that we need in a very nimble way locally to, to address the needs and the future needs of our region because that's at the heart of being able to attract businesses to locate here to be able to say to them we've got a really talented highly skilled workforce and there are skills which will be needed for the future economy you know and digital and so on which we really need to make sure people have access to and are developing and that will be how we attract investment to our region above and beyond what we've got and it'll also be a good way to strengthen the existing players and ex existing supply chains there's more that we think about how we do procurement locally through our public bodies to drive local supply chains and there's I think an increasing appetite for that from local authorities and other public bodies to do that so I think there's a real opportunity about how we work together around some of that you know so that we uh, we operate in a, perhaps a different way than we have before that we recognize as a sense of collaboration that needs to come out of this and we've learned to do that I think in the last few weeks and months in a number of different ways but that needs to be locked into how we work together. Thinking about that contractor that was telling me about how they'd worked on a Swansea Bay field hospital saying, you know, how what a pleasure it was to be working hand in glove with commissioners and other contractors and suppliers in a way where they had a sense of mission about what they were developing and none of the barriers that normally are in place. If we can bottle that, give that to everybody, you know, doing a project across our region, I think we'll have learned something very important coming out of COVID. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. That shared sense of working together collaboratively to solve problems. I just love it when I see great examples of that because all too often you hear about the obstacles that companies face and that the local authority faces in actually collaborating. If we can, as you say, bottle some of that, it would be really powerful. Well, thank you so much for your insights today, Jeremy. It's been a pleasure to talk to you and I really appreciate you taking the time. Have you got a garden? Are you able to enjoy some of this sunshine? Yes, I have and I've been growing vegetables that's the thing I've Have learned you? to do I've never really actually done that in the past but I've grown vegetables and now I've got more carrots and beetroot and kale and cabbage than I can shake a stick at so everyone we speak to is growing food and things I mean that's another massive culture change and hopefully one that we can capitalize yeah, on local absolutely. food but uh, yeah great well thank you for your time I've really enjoyed talking to you and uh, yeah keep us posted on what comes out of your work and particularly encouraging people to write to you at that email address give us the email address again Jeremy it, it's our future Wales at gov.wales our future Wales at gov.wales because it's uh, really a key theme for us at for the region to encourage that kind of crowdsourcing of wisdom yeah. and insights and sure. so uh, we really appreciate that work okay thanks very much for your time you, and uh, we'll keep in touch bye for now bye